I'm excited to dig in, get inspired, and get to the heart of learning by introducing our visiting keynote speaker, Dr. Peter Felton. Dr. Felton is the Executive Director of the Center for Engaged Learning, Assistant Provost for Teaching and Learning, and Professor of History at Elon University. Elon's a mid-sized university in North Carolina, and it's great to have Peter here with us today. He works with colleagues on institution-wide teaching and learning initiatives and on the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, sometimes called uh, SOTL. In his teaching, Dr. Felton aims to help students think critically and write clearly about the connections between the lives of individual people and larger themes in history. As a scholar, he's published six books about the undergraduate education experience, including uh, his most recent publication in 2020 with Dr. Leo Lambert. Uh, and that book's called Relationship Rich Education, How College Connections Drive uh, Success in College. Uh, he served as a president of the International Society for the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, and also uh, of the POD Network. Uh, the POD Network is the uh, US-based professional society for educational developers. He's currently the co-editor of the International Journal for Academic Development and is on the advisory board of the National Survey of Student Engagement. And finally, is a fellow of the John N. Gardner Institute for Excellence in Undergraduate Education, um, a foundation that works to advance equity in higher ed. Dr. Felton is joining us today to address the re uh, relationships at the heart of learning and teaching. You know, we know that uh, from decades of research that student to student, student to faculty, and student to staff relationships are the foundation of learning, belonging, and success for all students in higher education. These relationships also have a powerful legacy that have touched alumni for lives for years after graduation. In his upcoming keynote this morning, Dr. Felton will draw on nearly 400 interviews with students, faculty, and staff to explore how relationships are a flexible, scalable, and humane approach to ensuring that all students experience welcome and care, become inspired to learn, cultivate a constellation of mentors, and explore the big questions that matter for their lives and our communities. So without any further delay, I'd like to welcome Dr. Peter Felton. And Dr. Felton, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gavin. Good morning, everyone. Um, nice to be with you in Newfoundland or North Carolina. I wish I could be with you in Newfoundland. Thank you so much for having me here. Gavin, thanks for the kind introduction. Um, what, what I'd like to have us do this morning is do some thinking and talking based partly on the research Gavin mentioned and partly on your own experiences about the way relationships are at the heart of learning and teaching, even during a pandemic, and the ways we could move relationships even more central in our teaching, in our courses, in our curriculum, at our institution. So that's where we're going. I'm going to ask you to share some things as time goes on. There's going to be a breakout room where you'll have some chan uh, chance to talk to your colleagues. Um, there's chat, which is always available. And so I encourage you to um, comment and share things in the chat. And, you know, we have a generous amount of time so we can be conversational as we go. What I'm going to do first is set up a little bit of the foundation of the research that I'll be talking about with you this morning and then give you a chance actually in breakout rooms to talk with each other about your thoughts and your experiences and your practices related to relationships in higher education. So that's where we're going for now. Let me just begin um, by underscoring something Gavin hinted at. Um, this is from a synthesis of research. Oh. Let me say one thing before I even do this. Um, and I'm sorry, I forgot to say this already, which is when I realize I'm in the United States, which is not Newfoundland. Right? The research I'm talking about is based in the US. I think often Canadian and US higher education are fairly similar, but we're not the same. So um, I wanna offer what I'm saying here with some degree of humility and saying, I recognize this is often the case in my context, invite you to think about how it does or doesn't translate into your context. Okay, I don't want to make any presumptions about what I'm saying is definitely the case at Memorial. Um, so just encourage you to think about what this does inspire you to think about, what this might challenge you to think about, where you think there might be differences 
So all of that, um, I'm confident is true. So this, this idea, again, comes from a synthesis of research on higher education in the United States. Um, as Gavin mentioned, there's been decades of research back to the early 70s that demonstrates the importance of peer interactions among students and faculty staff interactions with students as being the single most important factor contributing to essentially every good thing that can come out of education. I mean, learning, motivation, you see that identity development, but also graduation and persistence. Actually, in the US, there's evidence that um, students or excuse me, alumni who report having strong relationships with peers and with faculty and staff are more likely to vote and more likely to be civically engaged than alumni who don't. So there's interesting, strong legacies of these relationships um, throughout our work. Uh, and the research in the US says the effects of these peer relationships, student peer relationships and student relationships with faculty and staff are particularly strong for students of color and first gen college students. And, and what that means in my context is the, the effects of positive relationships for marginalized students are particularly positive. And when, when marginalized students either don't have strong relationships with peers or faculty or staff or have negative interactions, the negative effects are particularly strong, right? So, so the effects of relationships are magnified for students of color and first gen students in the United States. And one other thing to note about this broad research, um, and it's particularly true again about first gen students and students of color in the US, but for all students in the US, undergraduate students in the US, which is quality is more important than quantity in interactions. So it's not essential that every student have a strong relationship with every faculty member they ever cross paths with. It's not important according to the research, that every student have a positive relationship with every single one of their peers. What's key is that students have some connections, some sense of mattering from faculty and staff, and some from peers that are key. And again, that's particularly important for students of color and first-gen college students. So knowing that this research exists, if you think about your own college experience, your undergraduate experience, you might also think back and say, what was what was the most powerful parts of that experience? I mean, in interviews we've done, we did a survey of 4,000 recent college graduates, recent university graduates in the US, people who graduated in the last 10 years, um, 4,000 alumni, representative sample, and it was very, very clear that um, students who had between alumni who reported having between three and at least at least three um, up to 10 positive relationships were much more likely to be thriving um, after college much more likely they were happy professionally and personally after college so thinking about your own experience you might have the same perhaps you have the same thought you think about what was powerful for you about undergraduate education and what often comes to mind is people, right? And so maybe you're saying to yourself, well, Peter, we know this, right? We know this from our own experiences. You're just telling me that there's decades of research in the US about this, so why did you have to write a book about it? Um, and my colleague Leo and I decided to write this book based on other research we had done, based on our experience at institutions. Leo had been president of my university, Elon University, for 19 years. We both seen this in with students and alumni very clearly in our own lives, in our children's lives, in our students and in the research. And, and what, we, what we noticed is that we all know this is true, but we don't organize our teaching, we don't organize our courses, our curriculum, our programs, our institutions as if relationships were the single most important factor in the quality of education for our students. And probably the single most important factor in getting towards the equity and justice ends that we have for our institutions and for our educational systems. And so what we try to do in this book is say, we know this is true. 
we ought to do this. In fact, it's possible to do this. And so rather than repeating the research that was done elsewhere, what Leo and I did is we traveled around the United States back when you could do this, oh, oh, and did, as Gavin said, almost 400 interviews, 394 interviews with students, faculty, and staff at 28 different institutions across the United States. We went to a wide range of different kinds of institutions from LaGuardia Community College in Queens, New York, which is has 50,000 students, almost all of them immigrants, almost all of them first gen, almost all of them low income, to Florida International University in Miami, which has 65,000 undergraduates, to Cal State Dominguez Hills in Los Angeles, which has about 25,000 students, almost all of them students of color, almost all first gen, to the University of Washington in Seattle, another huge flagship state university, and all sorts of institutions, big and small, private and public in between. We interviewed 204 students and the rest faculty and staff, and we asked them to talk about the programs, the experiences, the um, courses that they had that were relationship rich. When did they feel like they belong? When did they connect? What enabled them to connect? And what were barriers? Why wasn't this more central? in for faculty and staff why wasn't this more central in the work they do with students and for students when did they feel like they were connected what enabled them to connect meaningfully with peers with faculty and with staff and what were barriers for that and then we took those 400 interviews and thousands and thousands of pages of transcripts and we we tried to synthesize out what the key principles around relationship rich education are. And so let me just outline those really briefly for you here. And then I'm going to ask you to think about how these might apply in your own work and um, give you a chance to talk to some of your peers. So here are these four principles that came out of our interviews. Let me, let me unpack them just briefly for you. The first one is that students need to experience genuine welcome and deep care. All students do. And in the U.S., perhaps perhaps at Memorial, we tend to pay a lot of attention to initial welcome. We have a big orientation and welcome experience for our incoming new students. And then after that, they're sort of on their own for the next several years. You know, we, we're around, we try to help them, we try to support them, but there's nothing systematic done. And what um, one of the presidents of a community college we interviewed, Joy Smith at Oakton Community College outside Chicago said, is what students there need is relentless welcome. They need to be welcomed every day. They need to be welcomed by everyone they encounter. They need to feel some sense of deep care and connection. In fact, in, in institutions and faculty and staff can do lots of things to do this, you know, create welcoming spaces, be friendly, all these sorts of things. The, the really surprising thing that Leo and I found in our interviews was that what students said made them feel most welcome and cared for on campuses is when someone asked them, how are you? And actually listened to the response. So this idea of welcome and care, it needs to be woven throughout a student's experience, not just at the beginning. And it doesn't have to be complicated. It can be as simple as, how are you? We'll get more into that as we go. A second principle we found, um, and we heard this so strongly from students at all kinds of institutions, our relationships are probably the most powerful way to motivate students, to inspire them to learn. Faculty told us lots and lots and lots of stories about faculty who knew their name, who cared about them, who encouraged them, who challenged them in ways that pushed that student to do more than they thought was possible. Students also told us stories about peers who, you know, could tell when they were struggling and would encourage them or could challenge them and inspire them to compete to do better. So we think sometimes, I know talking to faculty colleagues, sometimes when they hear about relationship rich teaching and learning and relationship rich education, they imagine what in the U.S. is sort of conceived of as kindergarten education where, you know, the the professor every day welcomes every student with a hug and gives everybody a gold star, no matter how they perform. And that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is the way that when students feel seen, when students feel known, when students feel that someone cares about them and that they matter and that their learning matters, those students are much more likely to work hard, to ask for help, to do the things that are going to lead them to be successful. So that's principle two. 
Um, principle three coming out of our relationships is that students need to develop webs of significant relationships with a scholar, um, Brad Johnson, who studies um, adults and mentoring. Brad calls these constellations of mentors. And this, this might feel unfamiliar to, to you, especially if you came through graduate school, because graduate school in many places, you have this model of mentoring, which is a single dissertation supervisor, a single mentor who sort of guides you through the final years of your graduate preparation, prepares you for your post-graduation work, and, you know, and sometimes does all sorts of things for you in your life um, to prepare you professionally and personally to be successful, sometimes positive, sometimes negatively, right? There's two reasons why that's not um, a very good model for most students. It is a good model for PhD students, but it's not a good model for most students, especially for undergraduate students. One reason is very, very practical. There's just a lot more undergraduates than there are faculty and staff at our institutions. We could not deeply mentor every student one-on-one. -on -one. It's just not scalable. It's also probably not practical for us to be able to do that because as a historian, I know some things, I don't know a lot of other things. So I can be good at helping students think about how to write, how to read different kinds of sources, how to make sense of the past. I may not be the right person to think about how to use social media to help them build a network that will let them connect and find a job. I'm a historian, I'm not good at finding jobs. It's lucky to have one. So there, these, these sort of scale and practical reasons why webs of relationships are important, but the really good news is that the research, especially the research on undergraduates, is that what students need to be successful is a web, a network, a, connect, a set of significant relationships, peer relationships, faculty and staff relationships that can serve different purposes for them. There's a wonderful book by Janet McCabe called Connecting in College about student friendship networks and undergraduate student friendship networks in the United States. And, and she points out that what undergraduates really need is three kinds of support. They need academic support, intellectual support, she calls it. They need what she calls instrumental support about how to, how to do certain things. And they need emotional support. And the research on undergraduates suggests very rarely do students get all three of those things from one place or one person. And so what we need to help students do is build those connections so that faculty and staff perhaps can provide the intellectual and instrumental support, not always the emotional support. Friends can do some of each. And then the last point that we found in our research, the major point we found in our research, is that in the United States, at least so much of the culture around higher education is transactional. People talk about getting in, getting through, and getting out. And it's important that students have access to education. Of course, it's important that students make good progress through their education, and it's really important that they graduate. Of course, that's true, right? But the point of college isn't just to get in and through and out. The point of college is to learn and grow and to be able to be the kind of human who can have a successful life, who can thrive, who can contribute to their community and our world, right? And so what we need, what students need and what we as faculty and staff and institutions need to do is help students use the relationships they build, use the interactions they have to turn college from a transactional experience to a transformational experience, to explore the big questions in their lives. Who are they? Who are they becoming? Why are they becoming those kinds of things? What do they have to offer their community and their world? What can they give? Students can do that exploration on their own, but research is quite clear that being in a supportive community that encourages students to ask those kinds of questions and challenges students to not settle for simple answers to those kinds of questions can be really transformational for students. So relationships do a number of things. In other words, they help students feel like they belong and they matter. They help students be motivated to learn. They help students connect in ways that lead them to be successful at university and beyond. And they help them have a really transformational experience in higher education. Those are all great things that relationships enable.
in higher education. And I suspect, again, hearing those, maybe there's some ideas there or some, the framework is a little new, but I think a lot of that probably resonates with your own experience as a faculty and staff member. And so uh, I wanna recognize that you all know a lot. You'll have deep experiences, both um, often before the pandemic and during the pandemic. And so we'd like to take a little bit of time now and we're gonna get you into breakout rooms. You're gonna be randomly assigned to breakout rooms. So I encourage you first to have everyone introduce them yourselves, just who you are, what you do, and then ask you to talk about two questions and really try to share the time so no one person dominates. Um, first, what's worked for you to cultivate educational relationships? You could think about what you wrote in your matrix that Gavin had you reflect on, or you could, you could move beyond that. Um, if you like, this could be what's worked for you during the pandemic or what's worked for you before the pandemic. And then secondly, to think about what are some of the barriers to doing this kind of work? Because if it's so powerful, why don't we do it? So we're going to ask you to be in your breakout rooms for eight minutes, and then we'll do a little debriefing after that. So Gavin and Darcy, can you make the magic happen? Welcome back, everybody. I hope you had um, a good conversation with some colleagues. I, I expect you probably still were going strong as time ran out, and I'm sorry about that. But the good news is this is the first day of a two-day conference, um, and you're all colleagues, so there's ways you can continue these conversations. What I want to do now is use a little technology um, that you might be familiar with um, to get a sense of, of what you talked about in your small group small groups. So what I'm going to ask you to do is go to this web address. It's menti.com. Um, Darcy or Gavin will put it in the chat. And once you get there, you'll put in, it'll prompt you. It's really simple. It'll prompt you to put in this code. And you put in the code and you'll see the first question, which is what has worked for you to continue, or excuse me, to cultivate educational relationships. And so I'm going to switch over to menti. So, and then just type in your answer. And this is a way that's better, perhaps, than chat um, to see what people have to say. So again, you go to menti.com and put in this code 1770162. So curious what you might have to say. Thank you to whoever went first with group work. So it'll scroll naturally as more come in. So I don't know what you're seeing, but I am seeing lots of examples of trying to start with building interactions, connecting with students, helping students connect with each other through things like getting to know students' names right away, one-on-one -on -one time, very small group student work to begin with, asking students about themselves and about what they care about, and communication open, listening. I see some other really interesting ways of being in spaces where we can interact informally with students, whether that's getting to class 10 minutes early, staying a few minutes late and not spending all your time as I used to, packing and unpacking my bag and touching the computer, but just, just chatting with students, having an open door policy. I saw something about volunteering on campus 
or any non-educational conversations. So first, I want to I appreciate all that you've shared. There's lots of good ideas and lots of good practices here. Um, and my primary message for today probably will be to just keep doing what works well in your context already to build relationships. Just do it more intentionally, do it more often, do it with all your students. One of the um, things that a student said to Leo and I in our interviews that has really, really stuck with me, a simple comment, was a student at an institution about the size of Memorial said, I wish this institution treated all its students like it treats its honor students. And the, and the point with that comment, and the, why I bring it up, is I think we know a lot about what works for us, what works for us with our students to build these meaningful connections with them and to help them build meaningful connections with each other. The ch one of the challenges is just taking the time, as a number of people said, and having um, the intentionality to do this over and over. Okay, so you clearly had good discussions in your small groups. Now I'm gonna ask you to go back to Menti on the second question which is what are major barriers to developing educational relationships? And this is going to be a word cloud, so to make this work well, if you could put one word answers in, it'll give you the option to put four or five answers in. You don't need to put four or five, you could put one or two, um, but short answers will appear, one word answers will appear in the word cloud better than sentences. Not surprised, time is the first. We'll see if it remains the biggest. If you're not familiar with word clouds, um, the larger the word, the more frequent it appears. The smaller the word, the less frequent it appears. Um, and Menti is randomly organizing things, giving color and shape. So don't put too much into the color and shape. So just a few comments from me as this continues to unfold. Um, I'm not surprised that time was both the first barrier to appear and the one that remains the largest. Um, because all of us, I mean, this connects to things, other things there about workload, about class sizes, about research requirements, about daily schedules etc and remote the time time is key in this and we'll talk about ways to do this efficiently and to to build relationships in ways that are powerful um technology and distance i think in particular during the pandemic have come up although it's interesting to me just as an aside that i don't see covid i don't see pandemic as as a barrier there explicitly. Now, maybe it's taken as a given. Maybe we think it's um, it's a passing. We hope it's a passing one. And, and then there's some interesting ones there too about anxiety, about shyness, um, fear, isolation, stress. Okay, so I'm gonna, oops. I'm gonna come out of this. First, thank you for sharing this. It's, this is a different way than having everything stream by in chat and trying to understand. Um, I'm, I'm curious if people, anybody would be willing to unmute themselves and, and just talk for a minute, not, not long, but just a little bit about what you think are some of the most salient barriers here, especially I'm curious about um, people who talk about shyness, 
although it's ironic to ask people who said a barrier was shyness to speak to the whole group. So maybe something about anxiety or concerns about stress and and workload. What, what do those look like in your own context? Is anyone willing to unmute, say their name briefly, and then unpack that? We have one volunteer um, in the chat. Um, Thank you. Tom Halford. Thanks, Tom. Hi, uh, hey. my name is Tom. I teach at Grenfell campus. I think that, you know, just anxiety and fear from the student's point of view is such a worry because, you know, I know that transitioning from high school to university, you're still in that mode where you don't want to be seen talking too much to the teacher, right? So if you're trying to build a relationship with students as the teacher, I think that that's such a worry to, to take into account that you're really putting certain students at the forefront of others and, and you mm -hmm. could sort of be making some of them a little bit nervous, maybe, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's that's one of my thoughts, I guess. Yeah, Tom, I think that's a really, really important thought. In fact, one of the stories that, um, one of the interviews that I found in the end quite charming and endearing was with a student at the University of Iowa. And um, she introduced herself. She was, a, she was in her fourth year when I interviewed her. And she said when she was a first year student, she came from a small town um, and she was quite shy. And her goal was to not meet anyone new at the University of Iowa in her first year. And so she said she would go into often large classes and sit somewhere near a wall and try to look as unwelcoming as possible so no one would talk to her. Um, and, and this was a really significant barrier to her. And what, what changed her educational experience, she would say changed her life, was a faculty member reaching out to her. University of Iowa has something fantastic called the um, Conversation Center, which is like a writing center, but it's, it's a space designed originally for international students to talk to, um, to native English speakers and practice conversation. But what they found at the University of Iowa is that shy students often come to the conversation center to practice having conversations with peers who they don't know. And, and the student um, who I interviewed, this professor pulled her aside and said, you could really benefit from um, taking the conversation center course and becoming a conversation center consultant. And she did, and she said it really transformed her experience. So thanks for sharing that, Tom. It's really important to recognize not all our students are the same in many, many different ways. They have identities, of course, that are different, but they also have sort of sociality and confidence that can be very different, that can be significant barriers. Does anybody else volunteer to say anything, Gavin, or I'm happy to um, jump into the research. Nope, nobody's action. volunteered in the chat, Peter. Okay, well, great. Well, then we'll have to ask people as we go to think about what they can contribute. Um, please use the chat to add comments and questions. Oh, and then, um, and if you if you have questions you wanna interrupt, that's great. And Keith Power, I saw, said he has something to say around barriers. So Keith, um, could you unmute and talk, please? Sure, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, one of the things that I noticed, um, I'm not sure how to frame it, but maybe like the status quo or this definition of what we have with regards to whether it's online teaching, in-person teaching, remote teaching, and how we try and define those. And a few years back, I taught my very first online course. And at the beginning of the course, I reached out to the students, um, you know, just to have a one-on-one -on -one chat. And I said, hey, we can chat by Skype or we can you know, talk on the phone, whatever it might be. Um, I just like to get to know you and talk for five minutes, 10 minutes, um, you know, learn your name, where you're from, that kind of stuff. And I was really taken aback by a lot of the students saying that this is the very first time that somebody who is teaching an online course had actually reached out to them one-on-one -on -one to have a chat. They're so used to just uh, talking through, you know, the, the features of Brightspace or the online learning system um, but the professors or instructors, uh, when they're teaching online, seem not to be reaching out on that personal level. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, I'd only taught in person for like seven years. I was in front of the classroom. I was teaching, you know, face to face. So um, it was really weird to me when I started that online teaching that I wouldn't have the, those interactions. Uh, 
-hmm. But that's something I, th I think we need to break down that barrier of saying, you know, just because you're teaching online or an online course or a distant ed education course doesn't mean that you can't have those personal connections and reach out and, you know, we have the technology today and it's kind of ironic that now with remote teaching, this is what we are actually doing. So I thought that was a barrier uh, and I think people need to get past that barrier that it's, you know, this is an online course. And that definitely Keith, fits. Keith, I'm, I'm really grateful for you sharing that example because I, I think it's part of what you're saying that I think is really powerful. And I know this was true for me is, you know, I had always taught face to face before the pandemic. And so wrapping my head around what it meant to do an online course, to teach in an online course was really hard for me. And I didn't think to do things like connect in those ways right right away. But one thing I've found now, having taught for a little more than a year in a pandemic, is sometimes it's easier to connect with students one on one um, or in small groups online because they don't have to spend time coming to my office, coming to campus just to see me, right? And so Leo and I, for this book, we all of our interviews we conducted pre-pandemic. Um, but one of the places we visited, we actually visited was Southern New Hampshire University, which is, has 95,000 students, almost all fully online. And Southern New Hampshire does exactly what you're talking about, Keith. Um, every student at Southern New Hampshire has an academic coach or a writing coach who speaks with that student one on one every week. Just to check in to see how they're doing. And Southern New Hampshire has, um, pre-pandemic, had graduation ceremonies all over the country because their students are all over the United States. And they ask students, who would you like to come from Southern New Hampshire to the graduation ceremony? And the most commonly named people by far are those coaches, the people who students talk to one-on-one -on -one every week. And so you'll hear from one of those coaches in a minute from a quote, but one last thing I want to say is that we learned from Southern New Hampshire, and it surprised me a little bit, but it's it makes lots of sense, is many of Southern New Hampshire students are um, live in rural areas, small towns. Many of them are low income. And actually the coaches and the, the writing tutors prefer to meet with students by phone rather than online because for so many students bandwidth is a challenge and so what they're trying to do is make it as easy as possible they their default setting for these conversations is a phone conversation they say if students would prefer they'd happily zoom or skype or whatever they use but they're happy to do phone first because they want the barrier not to be the technology Okay, so Keith, Tom, thank you for sharing your ideas. Thanks everybody for um, using Menti. We'll come back to Menti in a little bit. And again, I really encourage you to use chat to raise questions, share resources or ideas, et cetera. What I wanna do now is get into some of the research that Leo and I did. And because our, our book and because our research was interview-based, I'm gonna be sharing some quotes from our interviews, from stories from our interviews. Seven of your colleagues from Memorial volunteered um, to be readers of these quotes. And so when I'm going to share the quote, I'll introduce the quote, and then one of your colleagues will be the voice of that person. I found this is a really helpful way in online spaces in particular to help everyone slow down and sort of really pay attention to the words. And so the first quote that I want to give you is from David Latimer who's an academic advisor at City Tech, which is part of the City University of New York system. Um, Shane is going to be the reader of this, but let me introduce the quote before Shane reads the quote for us. So David Latimer spent most of his career, well, he, if he were here, he would say he's a fourth generation college student. Um, and very proud of that. He spent most of his career working in the Harlem Children's Zone, which is a program in New York City to support black students in educational success. And David said he, he worked there for more than 20 years. He loved it. He thought he was doing valuable work. But what he kept seeing was students who were on the path to success, go to college, go to university, and then come back unsuccessful. And David said after seeing enough of this, he decided to go to the other side, to go to the university side, to try to fix what was wrong there. And so he works at City Tech, 
which is, as you might guess, a technical oriented part of the City University of New York, computer science, engineering, and whatnot. And David advises literally hundreds of students a semester and has for several years. And Shane's going to read what he told us about what students, what he sees students experience in the City University of New York. Students fear their failure of being challenged beyond their limits. They may not have been challenged academically in high school and for the first time are really experiencing academic rigor. They fear embarrassing their families, being afraid to come home and say, I'm not achieving in college right now, I'm struggling. They fear talking to a professor because a professor represents an intimidating authority figure. They also resist asking for academic help because that is perceived as meaning you're not smart. They do not want to go to counseling when they have emotional problems because that's for people who are weak. The fear of shame is everywhere. Thank you, Shane. And, and I want to be really clear here. What David's not saying is students today are snowflakes. Students today have all these pathologies. What he's saying is students today feel a lot of pressure to be successful. All, and David's working especially with first generation students at City Tech. And these students do what Clyde or Claude Steele, who's a psychologist at Stanford University, and he studies especially black students, but black first generation students in the US. What Steele says is these students solve every problem by over-efforting, over-efforting. The idea is they've been successful so far by working on their own. And if they encounter some struggles, what they do is they work even harder. So it's not that they're not resilient. It's not that they're weak or something like this. It's that they have one tool in their tool chest, and that is me working hard by myself. That has gotten them to university, but when they get to university, that is not a path to success, right? Because all of us, when we're doing really hard things, need peers, we need faculty and staff support, right? And, and so students in the US, the research is clear, especially first gen students of color are less likely than their peers to ask for help less likely to use university resources, less likely to go to office hours. And it's not because these students, again, are weak or something like this. It's because they think they, are, they can be successful entirely on their own. So part of what we have to do, David suggests, is help students understand that successful students ask for help. Successful students draw on the resources that faculty and staff and the institutions and their communities offer, right? So one of the powerful messages is this sense of isolation students have. One last point, if you know the research on shame, is if you feel ashamed that you're not being successful, you're even more likely to isolate yourself. You're even less likely to ask for help. And so there, there can be this cycle that happens if students are under a lot of pressure, they're trying to do well for themselves, for their families, for their communities, and they struggle and they feel ashamed that they're struggling. And so they work even harder, but even less productive and even more isolated. Now, we know that's true in general for college students in the United States. And we found that to be true and the research says that's true at Harvard as much as at a community college. It's at all kinds of institutions, all kinds of students. And then we have this pandemic. And, and like I said, um, we did all our interviews before the pandemic, but we did, interview folks who teach and work in fully online spaces. And Vicki is going to read this quote from Aaron, who is a writing coach at Southern New Hampshire University. So here we go, Vicki. One of the biggest hurdles our students have to overcome is the feeling of being adrift in online classes where they don't get to see each other face to face and when they can't go up to their instructor or to a friend in class and say, I'm really struggling with this, or I'm excited I've learned that. Thanks, Vicki. And I, we know this is true, right? We've all experienced this in the past year plus. As, 
as Gavin said in his introduction, we've all been reminded of the importance of connections between and among us, right? And we've all felt the loss of both some really significant connections and also those small connections of, you know, seeing a student smile when they solved the problem correctly. And, and, you know, you looking back at them and smiling and giving them thumbs up, right? That kind of small affirmation as well as the, the small I'm struggling it has really been lost for many people in online spaces. And we need to be attentive to that as, as Tom said in his remarks. Now, this also is, these barriers are not felt equally by all students on our campuses. And again, the US con context is different than the Canadian context, I know. But I'm going to share a quote. Lorna is going to read this one. This is a quote from Khadija Shea, who is a student at Bryn Mawr College, which is a small women's college, very selective, um, outside Philadelphia. And Khadija told us about her experience at Bryn Mawr. Um, Lorna, here you go. Coming to college was a difficult experience for me. There was the just being away from home part, and then there was race. I never felt like I was a student first. I always felt black first and then a student. For example, during my junior year, I remember walking into class on the day after Tamir Rice was killed by police. I was distraught. I walked into class and sat there and it seemed like no one else was phased by it. The day went on as usual for other students. It was just so surreal to have all of this weight on me because of something that happened and not feeling that reflected at all by the students and professors around me. Thank you, Lorna. And to understand Kadisha's comments even further, um, Tamir Rice, if you don't know, was a 13-year-old black child who was shot by police in Cleveland, Ohio. Kadisha is from Cleveland, Ohio. Kadisha is the oldest child in her family. She had, at the time, a 13-year-old brother. So this was particularly close to home. And what she said in, as this interview progressed is she didn't expect faculty teaching her courses or her peers to solve systemic racism and police violence in the United States. She didn't expect that of them. What she wanted is someone to say, how are you? And she didn't get that. And, and the research behind um, issues of black students in the United States and diversity, equity, and inclusion in the United States, one of the key findings of that research is that those of us who work at institutions, faculty and staff, need to be what's often called in the research institutional agents. We need to take the responsibility to step into uncomfortable spaces to be with our students, to support our students, to challenge our students on these issues. Um, you know, as a white man, it's easier for me to go, wow, that's too bad, and let things go. And Khadija's comments, what we heard from students all over in our interviews, and what the research says is we need to open up spaces, right? So I don't turn my course after something tragic like Tamir Rice is killed. I don't turn my course into a course on police violence. But I do create a little space in class. I do check in with my students just to see if they're doing okay, just to see if there's some resources or support on campus that probably won't be me, but it can be a support I can connect them with. And Kanisha would say, if someone had done that, that fall would have been a very different experience for her at Bryn Mawr. Right? So it comes down to something that Matt Smith at Cal State Dominguez Hills told us. Um, Keith is going to read this quote. Keith, you get a short quote as a reward for speaking earlier. But just so you know, if you don't know Dominguez Hills, it's probably the most um, racially and ethnically diverse university in the United States. And Matt works with students across the institution. And this is what he said about those students. Well, I'll read this one. No, I'm sorry. Okay. It's just okay. that uh, your name, when I clicked on the thing, it came up and uh, covered the quote. So I'll read it now. Sorry. No problem. Once your students recognize that you care about them and about where they come from and about their goals and what they're trying to accomplish, then you have a strong foundation for teaching and learning. 
Thanks, Keith. And this, this is really foundational to understanding um, how to do relationship-rich education well. The, the primary thing, the base of the pyramid of relationship-rich education is this conveying of care that you that they matter as individuals. There's there's really powerful research that's been around in the U.S. for quite a while. Oops. Um, the key term, if you want to dig into this, I, I would encourage you to look at is the word validation. It comes from Laura Rendon's work, which um, Laura's a scholar in Texas, studying mostly Latinx students, but student, lots of students of color, lots of students from all around the United States. And validation is not the same as self-esteem and boosting self-esteem. Validation is about conveying our, our belief in students' capacity as students and as humans to be successful. It's about conveying belief in their capacity, not saying everything they do is perfect. I'll talk about that more in a second. What Rendon's work does though, is shows when students feel validated, when students feel that there are faculty and staff, when there are peers in, in the institution that believe in their capacity to be successful, believe in their capacity as students and as humans. What that does is that empowers them in really powerful ways. This is a statement from a synthesis of the research on validation. It helps these students feel confident and motivated. It helps them be excited to learn, feel like they're part of a community, feel cared about as a person, right? Not just as a student. So validation is super powerful. And there's a number of ways we can do this. And what I wanna do now is give you a couple examples well, a tiny bit of research, an example from our quotes, and then a few practices that can help you validate and build these kinds of strong peer and faculty, staff, student relationships. The, the first thing I want to, want to share with you is something that was just, it rocked my world when I encountered this work. Um, and it's about how to, how to give feedback that is validating. Because um, I don't know about you, when I went through a teaching course when I was in PhD school many, many years ago, what I was taught to do is give a feedback sandwich to students. You know, so I'm a historian, so we grade essays. And what I was supposed to say is start by saying, you know, Peter, your essay does this thing well. And then have a whole bunch of the comments that are about things that are bad. And then the last words are supposed to be, keep doing that thing you do well, right? Um, the article I'm citing here, and all my citations are at the end, and you're welcome to have the slides and all this. This is an article by Darren L. Cole, a scholar at the University of Southern California. This is actually a large study of Black and Hispanic, is the language he used at the time, male students on US undergraduates, and how they receive feedback from faculty. And what Cole's research said, this is what rocked my world, is that a feedback sandwich actually for these students is alienating. It feels condescending. It makes them less motivated, less confident. And what Cole's research says is what we need to do is give feedback that validates. And, and his research demonstrates this is good for black and Hispanic male undergraduates in the US. I would suggest it's good for all students, it's probably good for all humans. And, and there's four parts, it's not that hard. The first part is key, which is convey high standards and expectations. You know, Peter, in history, at Memorial, we have high expectations. We know we would push you hard to read, write, analyze, think. And I'm confident that you're capable of doing that work. So convey confidence and capacity, even if the work doesn't show it right now. That's the key move, right? I know you're capable of doing this. This essay doesn't show me what you're capable of. Right? And then the third part is specific guidance tied to those high expectations, tied to that belief in capacity about how to improve. And then finally, connect students to resources to support their improvement. And that could be come to office hours. You know, the online quizzing is really useful. That We have a writing center. There's lots of things. It doesn't have to be more of your time. But the key here is to validate, you have to convey this sense that you believe in students' capacity to meet their stand, the standards and that you have high expectations. 
So I'd encourage you to think about how this kind of feedback is actually relationship building. It's building trust between you and students, especially students who come from marginalized communities, and it's helping students feel connected and less isolated and less ashamed, which is going to help them connect with their peers in ways that are powerful. So that's that's a that's a framework for giving feedback. I want to give you one more story here. This is probably my favorite story from all of the um, interviews we did all almost 400 we did. Jennifer, you're going to read this one and this is a two um, slide quote. And let me tell you some background about this. Joshua Rodriguez, this student who's going to be quoted, um, is a first generation US citizen. He's from Chicago. He grew up, he wanted to be a, he's always wanted to be a nuclear engineer. If Joshua were here, he's great. He loves nuclear engineering. He would tell us all about exactly what kind of nuclear engineering he wants to be um, and all this. And he did fairly well in high school. He got a scholarship to the University of Illinois, which was a couple hundred miles away from home for him. He went to the University of Illinois for his first year. He did fairly well in school, but felt so alone. And he told me in the interview, fortunately, his girlfriend back home got pregnant. And so he went home to raise um, a family, to get married, to work. And as his kids started getting toward 10 years old, he decided he still wanted to be a nuclear engineer, both for himself and for his family. So he went to the local community college, Oakton Community College. Uh, he told me the first day of class at Oakton was his 30th birthday. So he'd been out of school for a little more than 10 years. And he decided, he's a smart guy, he decided to take Calculus 2 as his first class, which you might think Calculus 2, that's crazy. But he'd done really well in Calculus, including Calc 2 at Illinois. So this was a way to get himself back on track to be um, a nuclear engineer. And so Jennifer, this is, this is how he began this story. Early in Calculus 2, we started getting into really difficult things, and I suddenly began having these feelings, like I didn't belong in this class, that my education, what I was trying to achieve, wasn't possible, and my goals were just obscenely farther away than I thought they were. Jennifer, we're just going to pause for a second, because I want everyone to really hear what Joshua is saying. He's not saying what I said when I took Calculus 2, which is, wow, calculus is hard. He's saying, my, I don't belong in this class. More importantly, when I'm trying to achieve, my goals are just obscenely further away than I thought they were. And notice the difference between math is hard and my goals, my life goals are obscenely further away than they thought they were. Those are very, very different things. Um, Joshua's story turns out well, though. So Jennifer, we're gonna pick it up. And this comes in two parts. I went to Professor Erko to say that I might have to drop out. He told me, Joshua, I don't want you to do the homework tonight. I want you to look up imposter syndrome and read about it. Then come talk to me. I did that and I learned that it is extraordinarily common among students. That interaction bolstered my confidence to realize that I'm not alone in this that everyone has these feelings. I went from contemplating dropping out to getting tutoring help and then getting an A in the course. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, what, what happened here is both an instance of validation, right, of Joshua, Professor Arco really seeing Joshua, seeing what he needed as a student, which wasn't go get tutoring right now on math. It was you belong here and you need to recognize that. So validating Joshua in that way. The other thing that this is an instance of that um, we read about a lot in the book is what Brad Johnson, who's a scholar of mentoring, calls mentoring of the moment. Right, Professor Arco, who's named here, was an adjunct faculty member, a contingent faculty member. Professor Arco, as far as we could tell, um, taught one semester at Oakton Community College. Joshua doesn't know Professor Arco outside of that classroom. They had no relationship before the class began. They have no relationship since, right? But what Professor Arco was able to do was be a mentor of the moment to Joshua, to see what he needed in that moment and to really bend the arc of Joshua's life and his education 
by this advice about looking up imposter syndrome. And just to close this story for you, Joshua now, um, he graduated from Oakton. He now is on scholarship at Purdue University studying nuclear engineering. And if he were here, he would say that conversation changed his career, changed his life, right? So a mentor of the moment can be as powerful as a long-term mentor in the right moments, in the right times when you can validate students. So that's a little bit of research about how to give feedback, a little bit of maybe inspiring and story about how to be a mentor of the moment. Let me give you some practical advice. These, these are all, I'm gonna give you four examples, four strategies that can be relationship rich. Two of them are how to ways to build faculty student connections, and two of them are ways to build student student connections in our courses. And for each of those pairings, one is rather easier and one is rather harder. All of them came up in our research, and all of them are backed by solid research beyond what we did. Example number one is to use student names. Um, and the research is really clear. It's really surprising to me too. We actually don't need to know students' names for there to be positive effects. What we need is students to perceive that we care to know their names. And when students perceive that, they feel more valued. They're more likely to ask for help. They're actually more likely to do homework. There's some evidence in some contexts, their grades are higher. Now you might say, I teach large classes. This isn't possible, I'm not good with names. The study that I'm referencing here, that's in the citations, is from Arizona State University. It's from intro to biology courses. The average class size is somewhere between 250 and 400 students per class. And what the faculty did in this study is they, this is pre-pandemic, is they required students to bring and use name, to make and use name tense in class. So every day on their, on their little table, student was supposed to put a name tense saying what their name was. And the professors in the study say they couldn't see all 400 students' name tense, but they could see some of them, right? So when they were doing interactive things, when students were asking questions, whatever, they could use those students' names, or they could say what I would have to say because of the quality of my eyes right now. You know, I can't see your name, but what's your name, right? And it's an easy way to connect up. And the study is fascinating because using those name tense led to students feeling more valued, more motivated, more comfortable asking for help, students to do more homework, students to get marginally better grades. Really small intervention about conveying that you care to know their names. And there's an extra benefit too, and I'm gonna ask Sharon to read this quote. It's not from our research, but it's from this paper. And it's from a student um, describing her experience be having require name tense in a class. So Sharon. Maybe Shannon. <laughs> oh, Shannon, I'm sorry. That's Shannon. okay. <laughs> See, I told you my eyes. Yeah. I didn't understand why the instructors asked us to use name tense. At first, I thought it was pointless. Nobody really cares what your name is. Now I see that knowing someone's name will help you talk to them. Calling people by name is better than, hey, want to study later? Thank you, Shannon. So again, there's this interesting side benefit too, which is using name tense in this case, wasn't just good for the faculty, didn't just lead individual students um, to feel more connected, more motivated, but it helped them connect with each other. Now, a second example um, of how to do this, it's a little more time intensive, but it's really, really powerful. It comes from Oakton Community College where Joshua Rodriguez was a student, and it's called a persistence project. The faculty created this project looking at data about whether students, which students succeed at Oakton, which students persist semester to semester, year to year towards graduation. And they read research about what could contribute to this. And so what faculty in the persistence project commit to do is once a semester in one of their courses, they do these four things during the first three weeks. They try to learn and use students' names, they articulate high standards paired with support. They give students some formative feedback, success-oriented feedback, not a grade necessarily, um, but some developmental feedback. And then the hard part, but actually they've done, they've developed a study pretty sophisticated in a sophisticated way at Oakton. Um, they meet one-on-one -on -one with each student for about 10 minutes. Every student's required to do that. That's the hardest part about doing this. That's also the most powerful part. Oakton's tried in a number of different ways without that one-on-one -on -one meeting. The other parts have slight benefits, but not a lot. 
The Persistence Project has very significant benefits for student outcomes at Oakton, and the students who benefit the most are black male students, but all students benefit very significantly from this. And one of the things that is um, that Oakton faculty were surprised by and really um, found powerful was what happens in those one on one meetings. And so Lisa Russell is going to read a quote from Holly Graff, who's a professor at Oakton, one of the faculty who created the Persistence Project. And this is what Holly told us about that experience. I've been teaching here a long time and I still am in contact with some of my students from 20 years ago. But when I added the one on one conferences, it transformed me and my students. I am not just getting to know the students with whom I might have the greatest affinities. Instead, I am getting to know all of my students and there's a big difference between those two things. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, notice Holly's point. Then when we just are invitational, everybody come in, come see me. We only see certain students. And the research in the US suggests this we're likely to see privileged students, we're more likely to see white students, students whose parents went have college degrees. And so if we want to see all our students, requiring it takes a lot of our time, it can feel a little uncomfortable, but it leads to us connecting in powerful ways with all of our students. And that's very, very powerful. So those are two faculty things that we can do to build a relationship rich class experience, whether we're doing face to face or virtual or somewhere in between. But again, there's far more students than there are of us and time is precious for us. It's precious for our students too. So how do we do things that help students build meaningful connections with their peers in our classes? Two examples of this. Um, the first one's really simple. A number of students talked about this as a powerful example. They didn't give me the citation, but we found the citation later. Um, but it's a really simple technique, which is um, in the literature, sometimes it's called note taking pairs. And the idea is a faculty member just periodically pauses in class and asks students to compare their notes with a couple peers, asking them to talk about both the substance of the notes and the format of the notes. You know, why'd you organize your notes that way? What, what do you understand? What don't you? And then do some degree of debriefing that. What are different ways to take notes effectively in this class? What students told us, what the research says on a technique like this is, first of all, many students don't come to university understanding how to take notes in different disciplines. Their physics class might be different than a history class, might be different than a music theory class right? or a nursing class. And then secondly, students will sit near each other when we don't have pandemics, but they don't necessarily talk to each other. And if they talk to each other, they often don't talk about academic things. So giving them the chance the requirement, the prompt to talk to peers about something academic, like what do your notes look like? What do you understand and what don't you? Why do you, why do you keep your notes like that? Can be really, really powerful both in that moment and also in building a connection. So if I suddenly can't come to class one day, I know which of those students I've talked with who I wanna follow up with to get notes and to understand what happened because I know who takes good notes. Um, and who can help me succeed. So this is a simple, very low time, low stakes way to build connections among students. A broader connect, a way to do this is to structure group works to support all students. I'm gonna go back to Shane reading a quote in a minute. This isn't a quote from our research, but it's a quote from a research article that I found really powerful and persuasive. Again, this research was from large courses, large STEM introductory courses. The courses were at Arizona State University and Florida International University. And the scholars doing this research first asked faculty about why students sometimes struggle or resist group work in their introductory classes. And what the faculty is tended to say is students tend to be lazy. They don't want to do the extra work. Sometimes they're shy. They just don't commit to it. And then these faculty, and excuse me, these scholars studied what actually happened in groups in these large courses. And this is what they report. So here we go, Shane. Our data raised the possibility that perhaps instead of students being lazy or unmotivated, 
Students face barriers such as anxiety about group work, low perceived value of peer discussion for their learning, or contending with other students in the group who are dominating. Reframing inequities in participation in this way puts the onus on the instructor to structure the interactions in peer discussions to promote equal opportunities for allowing students to participate in the learning activity. Thanks, Shane. So, you know, this is a fancy way of saying it turns out students are like other humans and some of them are jerks in small groups and some of them try to dominate and sometimes we don't know why we're asked to do what we're asked to do. And so the key here is that it's on us, the faculty, um, to design group interactions that are going to promote equity and learning for all our students. And so this article and other research goes on to offer some suggestions. Oops, let me just unpack these really quickly. Um, one is to assign students to relatively stable groups. So groups that are going to be the same for at least a few weeks and have a little bit of time for group activities and group bonding, you know, just connecting. And this could be, you know, playing some doing some sort of introductions or names. It doesn't have to be, you know, trust falls and challenge courses. It doesn't have to be silly. It can be very substantive, but help the group learn about each other, come to trust each other a little bit. And then um, put some structure around the group interactions, especially having well-defined roles that rotate among group members so that the same person can't be the note taker, the same person isn't the spokesperson, the same person isn't the timekeeper for the group all the time, and then give students hard challenges so that they need each other and they need to think things through. If you give them too simple of problems to solve in small groups, it's easy to default to let the one person just write it down. And then last and certainly not least is explain why you're, you're asking students to work in groups, what you want them to learn from the group process, how all of them can learn from this, because the research is really quite clear that all students learn from well-structured group work. Different students might learn different things. A student who doesn't know the basics in a course will learn content, will learn basic skills. Students who have mastered content and skills will learn higher order thinking things, more complex thinking. So helping students value what's happening in the groups and explain why the group work matters is really powerful. So that's just four strategies. I know there's probably a million others we could talk about to help you build connections with your students and help you help your students connect with each other. I'm gonna ask you to think again about what you could do going forward to build your classrooms and your work with students to be even more relationship rich. But before I do that, I just wanna remind you of something we did at the beginning, what you talked about at the beginning, which is probably the most important thing you can do is do what you're already doing well that works. Do that, do even more of that. But maybe you got some ideas from today from something somebody said in your small group from one of the examples I shared about things you could do. So to do a little more group sharing, to get some more ideas out, um, I'd, I'd love it if you'd go back to Menti. It's the same code. I've got to switch over to Menti so I can advance to the next prompt. And the prompt is going to be, what's something you will do um, to move relationships to the heart of your work with students? So what's something you'll do to move relationships to the heart of your work with all students? One-on-one -on -one interviews. Listen, wonderful. Name tense. You know, one of the benefits of remote, and remote hasn't been great, but um, WebEx, Zoom, all these things give people's names right up front. I love this, talk less, listen more. I see in here live sessions. I just wanna reinforce something. One of the lessons I've taken from COVID is to treat the time we have, what in remote world you'd call synchronous, treat it as really precious. Um, if I'm going to give a short lecture in, for my students, I can record that often um, and then spend the time with students, not having them, you know, stare at me, but having us together engage. So finding ways to interact with students, modifying how I give feedback, personalizing feedback, actively listen. Such good ideas. 
as preferred names. That's a really powerful. Pronouns and preferred names can be really powerful. And it's also a way of showing that you care about students as individuals. As, as a quick aside is the scroll. There's a lot of research in the US and around the world about how a sense of belonging is important for students to be successful. But, but I have some concerns about some of that research because that research tends to be strongest with students um, who are in the majority. And so I'm really drawn right now to work on mattering rather than belonging. And mattering is about students feeling like someone cares that they're there, someone cares who they are, and that their presence matters, their contributions matter. And so thinking about ways we can convey mattering to students, and again, names, and using the names students want to be called, pronouns, and just being human, being real and open to discussion. So lots and lots and lots and lots of really good examples. I want to close with a little bit of time for discussion, but before we do that, I just want to share two um, final quotes. And so um, the first one's going to be read by Vicki. And this is a quote from Taylor Schlesinger. When I interviewed her, she was just about to graduate from LaGuardia Community College, and she worked in the Writing Center there. And um, Vicki's going to read this quote, and then I'll explain a little bit about it about why this quote here. At the start of class one day, about halfway through the semester, my first year writing prof said to class, near the end of the semester, one of my best students is going to stop coming to class because they feel overwhelmed with all the pressure and they are really scared that they are going to do poorly. I want to assure that student to keep coming to class, even if you missed an assignment or you feel like you didn't do well on an essay because it's going to be okay. Come see me. Don't just disappear. Thank you, Vicki. So two things I want you to notice about this. One is this is something the professor said to all students at the same time, right? But Taylor heard it as particularly important. So one of the ways we can save time, um, one of the ways we can manage our heavy workload in large classes is sometimes saying things to the whole class we might say one-on-one. Um, -on -one. The second thing about the story that I love is Taylor told me this story as a writing center consultant at LaGuardia. And she said, the thing is when that professor said that to me, I thought he was talking to me, right? And I did go, I was about to drop out and I did go see him and I was successful in the class and I ended up being a writing center consultant. And she said, now that I'm a writing center consultant, every semester I have students come in and they say, the professor said, one of my best students is gonna drop and don't do that, right? And he pointed me to the writing center. And so Taylor sees, she, she laughed as she told the story because she said she was sure the professor was talking just to her. And what she sees now is a lot of students are in that same place of doubting their capacity and needing to make a connection. So there's that. And then the final, final thought, I get to read this one because it's really short. It's from another community college student in the US, which is it really only takes meeting that one person to ignite a fire within you. And, and so what I wanna encourage you to do is think about your class, your work with students as a place where your students will meet that one person. That one person doesn't have to be you. It might be, sometimes it is, and it feels really good when it is, I'll grant you that, but it doesn't have to be you. Odds are actually based on the research that one person is gonna be someone else sitting in the class. And so how do you create a relationship rich experience for your students in your course, in your program, at Memorial, so that they find that one person? who really conveys belief in their capacity, inspires them to learn, helps them have a transformational experience in college. Because I think if we can do that, all our students can be successful during the pandemic and after. I'm um, like, oops, I promised, oops, I promised references. There they are. Um, and if people have questions, if things you wanna challenge, raise ideas. I'm really open to comments, questions, suggestions, concerns at this point. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Felton. Um, uh, always great to hear you speak. Uh, and one of the things that I really do appreciate 
is um, some of the ideas that uh, you provide us based on evidence that we can take away to our own classroom. So thanks so much um, for coming here and, and sharing um, your uh, research and also the, the broader literature. Um, I'm feeling inspired to make a few small significant changes that I think will encourage um, my students to feel more connected amongst themselves. And um, if, if appropriate, as you mentioned to me as well, um, I'm now going to open the floor to part uh, to a question and answer period uh, with Peter. Uh, if you have a question, I just encourage you to um, post it in the Q and A or um, Q and A or chat. Darcy, you can feel free to interrupt, and um, I'm happy to look at the chat. So feel free to post it in the chat. Um, and uh, that chat box is in the bottom right hand side of the screen. Uh, make sure that you select. Um, uh, everybody that you asked the question to so that everybody can see it. And then I will um, ask the question on your behalf to Peter. Um, we, I'm, we're supposed to theoretically stop in four minutes, but I suspect, um, Peter, you're open because I know that we've chatted about this to take a little bit more time. So I'm going to say at least 10 minutes of, of Q&A and we'll see where we get. Does that sound good to you, Peter? Okay, That's great. Perfect. Yeah. And of course, if people have to run, people have to run. I really appreciate it's such a busy time of year. So thank you for being yeah. here. Yes. And that's the beautiful thing with WebEx. You can slip out the so-called the, the virtual back door and nobody's going to notice. So yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'd welcome anybody to post their questions that they have for Peter in the um, in the, the chat. Um, or if you're feeling brave, um, you can also um, unmute your mic and ask your question directly. And hi, this is uh, Tom Cooper. I'm happy to ask. I can't type very fast, so I'll just ask my question if that's okay. Uh, yeah, totally fine, Tom. Uh, Peter, thank you so much. That was an awesome presentation. I learned a lot, and uh, there's lots of tactical things I think I'll bring back to my teaching and learning uh, around that. So thank you again. Um, Peter, uh, I'm in the Faculty of Business at Memorial, and one of the things that we discuss as a faculty, and we met every two weeks uh, starting in the pandemic, and we still continue to talk about teaching and learning on a biweekly basis, which I think has been really awesome, is the fact that we have, um, I would say, a significant minority of students who are basically unreachable, uh, whereby, you know, they're not answering emails. We would reach out and say, how are you doing? You know, all the things that tactically we would were taught and we try and do. And then at some point you kind of go, you know, how much more effort that we put them into, even if you are trying to develop the relationships. Do you have any thoughts or anything that you've seen in the research for reaching the unreachable students? Is there anything that we can do, you know, because I always feel bad for them and, I, and I, I'm not sure if it's, you know, and I, I take the structural inequities that, that mm -hmm. are in place, both systematic and, and race, uh, but how do we reach the unreachable? Yeah, Tom, great question and really important question. And so, and if there was an easy answer, um, you'd already have it, right? So let me just suggest, I think, three things that get towards the complexity of this. One, which is trying to find ways of understanding who the unreachable are in your context. There is some research that suggests, when there's quite a lot of research that suggests students behave differently in different courses. Right. So what might happen is I might have a student in my class who is unreachable to me because they hate history, um, who is Tom's best student. Right. And so at that point, you know, it's unfortunate I'm not reaching this student, I'm not connecting, but as an institution, as a program, as a school, we're not that worried about that student because they're connected somewhere clearly, right? So one is trying to map things a little bit to find out if there's students who really are completely on the margins or not. Um, and then as you're doing that mapping, thinking also about equity issues. So are there patterns there? Is it female students in business? Is it indigenous students in business? Is it, you know, what are there patterns? And there may or may not be. Is it rural students? Is it students who are over 25 years old? Something like this, right? Because you could design then systemic interventions to deal with this. So part one is that. Part two is, um, I think, as a because you are talking as a as a faculty, think about what are the structural things we can do as a group, 
to reach out. So, I mean, one of the things I appreciate about how Southern New Hampshire does this is a student will have one writing coach for all of their courses. And that writing coach calls the student every week and checks in about all of their courses. And, and so it's really systemic. It's not on individual faculty on off the side of their desk doing this. If this is a significant concern, think about ways to build a significant response. And then, and then the third is, I think, to go back to creating that kind of environment in our classes that, that are relationship rich and explaining to students why we do this. Um, if, if you want to read one book on this that I think, I don't know if this is the case at Memorial, but I suspect based on the research in the U.S., there's a wonderful book by Anthony Jack called The Privileged Poor, which is a study of low-income students at Harvard University. And I realize Elon University and Memorial are not Harvard, um, but it's a really rich study of low-income students. And what Tony demonstrates in his book is that there's two kinds of poor students, low-income students at Harvard. One kind who've had a lot of college prep work and understand that this, the faculty and the resources at Harvard are designed for them. And then there's another kind of poor, um, Tony in the book calls them doubly disadvantaged students who recognize their disadvantages and think the resources at Harvard are not for them. The faculty are not there to meet them. And there's a wonderful, wonderful, horrifying study of community college students in Los Angeles. When, and in this study, they ask students what office hours are and community college students in Los Angeles. The most common response was those are the only times faculty have to do work in their office. And so I would never go to a faculty member's office hours because I know they're teaching multiple classes. They're so busy and they only have three office hours in a week. Right? Tony's work at Harvard says the same thing, that doubly disadvantaged students at Harvard don't understand that office hours are time that faculty would like students to come talk to them. Right? So we have to explain these things. As Tony's book says, we often tell our students on the first day of class what or when office hours are. We almost never tell them what they are, right? And so some of this might be misunderstanding. Some of this might be a lack of confidence or navigating the system. I hope that helps, Tom. It's really important what you're trying to do with your colleagues. And I'm glad you're doing it together. Other questions, comments? Uh, there's a question in the uh, chat here, Peter, from Aaron Fraser. Um, and the question is, I'm really interested to hear about uh, the ideas of booking 10 minute meetings with each student. Uh, what do you recommend is the best use of those 10 minutes? <laughs> Great question, Aaron. I'm a historian, so my answer to everything is it depends. Um, and, and, and it does depend partly on, you know, is this a first year course? Are these fourth year students, upper level students, et cetera? Do you have relationships with them already? I, I think the core thing is a little bit of introduction. You know, who are you? Why are you studying history? What brings you to this class? I like asking assets oriented questions. So start with a question, not about what's going to be hard about this class or what are you worried about, but start with a question of, you know, what do you feel well prepared for in this class? What part, what part of this class is most interesting, exciting to you, right? And talk about that to be able to draw on students' strengths and interests, and then perhaps get to what else do you want to tell me? Are there any concerns you have? Are there ways I can support you, right? So it doesn't have to be super complicated, but it's a little bit of who are you in a welcoming way, let's build some connection, why are you in this class and this discipline? Where to go? Um, one last thing really quickly on this, Aaron. One of the people we profile in the book, a faculty member, um, who actually spoke at Memorial, Brian Dewsbury. Um, he, you know, he does this belonging question or purpose question at the beginning of his Intro to Biology courses, which is why are you studying biology? And asking that question, I think, can be so powerful in reminding students to think back to why they're studying what they're studying can be so powerful for them. I will say thank you um, for your time today, Peter. Um, I know that um, folks in the chat have been appreciative of the fact that you're um, not only 
pointing to the research um, that you've done with your colleagues, the literature as it exists, but also providing really practical um, um, evidence-based um, examples and, and actions that we could take into the classroom. So thank you um, for um, your uh, ongoing engagement with us in this regard. Um, I'm thank just gonna uh, provide, uh, I'll let you say thanks, um, Peter, I'll pause here. Thank you, Gavin, and it's an honor to be here and um, be really fun to be in Newfoundland too, but yes, I'm glad to be with you we'll, from we'll, North Carolina. So. Yeah, we'll certainly uh, have you here the next time. Uh, Peter, there was a question about uh, imposter syndrome um, and uh, what uh, advice or um, if you know of how you would, uh, beyond just identifying that imposter sy syndrome exists and you might be um feeling it uh, how do you how do you help a student um and let's be frank imposter syndrome uh exists uh in in uh professionals in higher education as well um how do how do how do we uh, any any thoughts on the on addressing uh, folks that are feeling um that yeah great question lisa um, and as Gavin said the research is actually really clear that um higher education is one of the places higher education careers and one of the places where imposterism is strongest professionally because um, of the nature of our work. So our students aren't alone in this. Um, one thing I'd encourage you to do is talk to some social psychology colleagues. Um, some of them probably know quite a lot of the research and quite a lot of the practices, which can be quite good. Um, two broad approaches to helping students deal with imposterism. One is to just name it and say that it's extraordinarily common among humans and especially among university students. And so helping students recognize that they, what they're feeling they're, um, isn't unique. And then secondly, there's really, there's really powerful social psychology interventions that can help students through imposterism. And, and two, and again, you should talk to your social psychology colleagues to th think about ways or our folks at the center to think about ways to adapt these in your own context. But the, the two basic versions of these are asking students to write and then say, and both writing and saying help with this, something either to describe something they're good at and what they do that makes them be good at this or ask them to write about something they value a lot in their life and why they value it. Right? And both of those things, the, the reflection and then the saying part, telling you, telling a peer, telling a family member, whatever it is, um, is really powerful. In, and the saying part seems to matter quite a lot. The key with this, tell me something you're good at is, you know, if they talk about a video game or a sport or art or whatever it happens to be, when you're asking them, what do they do to be successful? What your students will describe is, you know, I, I ask for help. I don't give up. I keep working at things. I try to look at perspective and problems from different perspectives. I take a break and come back to things when I'm stuck, etc. All of those things, when they say them, if they don't make the connection to academic work, you can for them. And so to help them see that they have the capacity, they have the skills they need to be successful in your course, they just might not recognize it that what they need to do is transfer their, their practices from playing video games or from fixing cars or from playing the oboe um, to a math course. Thanks, Peter. Does anybody else have any other questions? You know, Peter, I'm, I'm reminded of um, a piece of literature as you're talking about uh, having students uh, write about their strengths or talk about their strengths, a, a, a similar kind of uh, a piece of uh, research that had to do with um, students writing um, uh, pre-writing before they wrote a um, an assessment, a, a summative mm -hmm. assessment, an exam in this case. And now, um, I, the, uh, the author um, escapes me, and you're likely familiar with it, but I do think it's really interesting. Um, these affirmative statements seem to have a really um, uh, 
a significant effect effect uh, on yeah. student success in that in this particular piece of um, work, when students were able to write um, affirmative statements about their abilities to succeed, they in fact outperformed um, students who did not write um, such mm -hmm. a statement. And that's a really simple intervention, as far as I can see. Again, mm -hmm. speaking to uh, perhaps the power of allowing students to see what they're good at and how they can be successful. Yeah, um, Gavin, that's exactly right. A couple places you might look for that kind of thing. There's there's broad work on mindsets, growth mindsets versus fixed mindsets or grit that align with that kind of thing in social psychology. My favorite work on this though, isn't from social psychology, it's from writing studies. There's a book by John Bean called Engaging Ideas, which is about writing assignments and writing practices. And one of, one of Bean's things, which I love, isn't about writing affirmative stuff. What he encourages us to do is ask students when they're turning in a written whatever, is to write a paragraph that says, if I had more time, this is what I would work on. Right? So they're not asking, you're not asking them to critique their work. You're not asking them to tell you how awesome their work is but you're asking them to identify, and first you're, you're normalizing that nobody has enough time, right? That we all wish for a variety of reasons we could do even better, but we don't, right? So first you normalize that. And then secondly, you get a little bit of insight into a student you know, who turns in an essay in their history course and says, I really needed to work on commas and formatting and you know, there's no evidence that tells me something versus a student who turns in that essay and says, I think, you know, page three and four just aren't, I don't have any evidence there. And then my feedback to that student can be quite different. Um, because even if the students performed exactly the same way, that first student, I might be much more concerned about than the second student who I might say, be able to validate and say, you're exactly right. The weakness of this paper, the area you need to build on is page three and four in the evidence. So do that next time. You're capable of doing that. You showed me that. You're correct. I just uh, uh, also echo there that it's also a really um, important strategy because it helps you as the uh, individual providing feedback to focus on perhaps what the students want to have the most feedback on. So instead of you know, commenting on all the comma splices, um, you mm -hmm. can uh, provide feedback on the where they're having the most trouble. Uh, in, an interesting approach, absolutely. Uh, well, Peter, uh, I'm looking at the time. I know that you, uh, sadly, because you're not with us here in Newfoundland and Labrador, you have meetings to go to. <laughs> and uh, and so I don't want us to be the reason that um, you're unable to join your next meeting. And I think you deserve a little bit of a break as well. So I'm going to um, uh, say thank you once again for joining us this morning. Um, really appreciate uh, the time and the, and, the, and the wisdom that you shared with us. Um, including the voices of of the students and professionals that, that you interviewed that that certainly enlivened um, and, and in, it has uh, important takeaways. So um, I'm going to say thanks um, and we're all going to uh, disappear into the ether um, and look forward to um, connecting with you again um, sometime soon, either through Twitter or email or some other um, a means or mechanism. Thanks, Gavin, and thanks, Cameron, yeah. Darcy, and everyone for um, making this possible. Have a great conference, everyone.